Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Hearts, a Healthy Relationships Class for Autistic People, co-taught with Autistic Teachers. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. To the right of your screen is the control panel. As an attendee, you have the option of listening in using your computer or by phone. To switch from computer audio to phone, just select phone call in the audio panel and follow the dial-in information. If you're having trouble hearing me, please send a message through the questions pane and we will assist you. At the end of today's event, you will receive a certificate of attendance via email. Since your mic is muted by default, you can submit questions to our presenters by typing them into the questions pane at any time. We will hold off answering any questions until the end of the presentation. Since most of you are now here, let's get started. To those of, us, to, to those of you who have just joined us, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Arts, a Healthy Relationships Class for Autistic People, co-taught with Autistic Teachers. My name is Claire Robinson and I'm your host for today's event. It's great to have you all with us today. Without further ado, I'll turn over to today's speakers, Dr. Emily Rothman, Reed Kaplan, and Dr. Laura Graham Holmes. Over to you, Emily. Great, thank you so much, Clara. I'm really looking forward to the presentation today. Clara, before we get started, can you uh, tell me how many people we have who have joined us as audience members? That's just one thing I wasn't able to see. At the moment, we're at 24, but uh, more people are joining at, at, at the moment as well. Great, okay. Well, welcome to all of the participants. So glad that you're here. Uh, I'm Emily Rothman, and I am going to be presenting to you with uh, Laura and with Reed. Um, we've worked together on uh, the development of HEARTS, and we would like to acknowledge funders. So we have funding from the National Institute of Health, NIMH, uh, to develop and test this intervention. And historically, we also had funding from Organization for uh, Autism Research that helped us with a precursor to the HEARTS intervention. So thank you to our funders and this opportunity to talk with you about our uh, intervention. Okay, so before we get started, I guess I wanted to um, just mention for anybody who's listening that we do talk about uh, uh, the existence of intimate partner violence and dating abuse and sexual violence in this presentation. There is nothing graphic uh, or explicit, but I just wanted to mention that we do uh, raise those topics. You think Reed's going to say something here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so April is Autism Acceptance Month, and part of that is being respectful of the language that autistic people use to talk about ourselves. Um, and so within this presentation, our materials, we use identity first language, such as autistic person, um, because within the autistic community, being autistic is a really important part of our identity, and we'd rather acknowledge that through language rather than using person-first language, just such as person with autism. Thank you for that, Reed. And you know, one thing that I'm realizing is that we may have forgotten to introduce ourselves. So let me back up and do that at least for myself. And then I'll offer for Reed and Laura, if you wanna say who you are as well. So I'm Emily Rothman and I'm um, a professor uh, and chair of the Occupational Therapy Department at Boston University. And previously, when I started working on this program, I was at Boston University School of Public Health. Um, Reed, would you like to say anything further by way of introduction? Sure, um, so my name is Reed Kaplan. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm currently a PhD student in social policy at Brandeis University. Um, where my research um, focuses on community living for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as um, information and cognitive access. Um, and I started working on this project when I previously worked at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network as their Associate Director of Advocacy and Development. And I'm really passionate about um, partnerships between autistic and non-autistic researchers. So very happy to be here. Perfect, thank you, Reed. And Laura, do you wanna say a little bit more about yourself? 
Sure. Um, I'm Laura Graham Holmes. I'm an assistant professor at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College. Um, and uh, when I started working on this project with Emily, I was a postdoc at the Boston University School of Public Health. Perfect. Thank you for that. Sorry, I forgot that from slide one, but glad we caught up. <clears throat> so now that we've sort of like set the basics, um, let's describe a little bit of the, you know, the background information or the background knowledge that made us think at the outset it would be a good idea to develop this intervention. So as I'm sure many of the um, listeners here uh, or in the audience know, bullying victimization is far too common among autistic youth and autistic people in general. So as many as 46 to 96 percent of autistic youth have experiences of bullying at some point. Um, the other thing that we know is that uh, autistic people are more likely to say that they're dissatisfied with the current number of friendships that they have as compared to non-autistic counterparts. So it would be about 60% of autistic people 18 to 24 years old and 18% of non-autistic people say that they're not happy with the number of friendships that they have. So interestingly, research suggests that even uh, compared to youth with intellectual disability, for example, when they've done a survey of autistic youth, they find that the autistic youth are um, more likely to say that, for example, they've never seen friends. So you can see 39% of autistic youth as compared to 20% of youth with intellectual disability said, I never see friends. And that pattern is true for all four things on this slide. So in terms of never getting called by friends, it was 47% of autistic youth as compared to 17% of youth with intellectual disability. Um, never being invited to activities or feeling socially isolated, same thing. So um, in fact, um, when they get to be adults, 40% of autistic adults do not experience reciprocal friendships. And, you know, this loneliness or being unhappy with social relationships has consequences for people. So uh, people often will feel depressed and it can translate into employment problems or academic problems when people feel like they're not getting what they want or what they need out of their social relationships. So that was important to us and something that we were really thinking about. We were also thinking about people's sexuality. And so I'm going to let Reed uh, jump in and talk about this a bit. Yeah. Um, so something that has been debunked is this idea that most autistic people don't experience sexual attraction. And this is a myth that has been perpetuated for many reasons. The main one, I think, is because autistic people are infantilized by society. And so there's this belief that we don't want to have sex or don't understand what sex is. And this keeps us from having access to that information that will help us learn about healthy relationships and healthy decisions. Um, but what we are finding is that um, many autistic people experience same gender attraction. So it may be that it's not that we're not feeling these feelings. It may be that because um, the framing of our society is such through this heteronormative lens, um, when looking at autistic people who socialize and have sex and relationships that may look a little different from non-autistic people, um, we need to be thinking about that as we're creating these materials and making sure that autistic people see themselves and that these materials are presented in a way that's relevant to our lives. Perfect. Thank you. So I guess when we set out on this idea that, you know, we, we wanted to create this intervention and it was coming out of this idea that, well, we know that there are autistic adults and people who are not happy with the number of friendships that they have or the quality of their friendships. And they definitely want to date and like everybody else experiences challenges in dating relationships and sometimes unfortunately experiences sexual harassment or sexual abuse. And we want to prevent that. So what is it that we want to create that will speak to those needs? Now, one thing that we, of course, knew about or had heard of, and uh, maybe you have too, are something called social skills interventions. Uh, and here's a list of different social skills interventions. We had gone into the scientific research literature and tried to figure out which social skills interventions have been tested through randomized controlled trials and found to have a positive impact. And, and we found a list of 16 
that had done that. Um, so that's good news. Uh, and, it, you know, although what social skills interventions tend to do is not the same thing that we had in mind that we wanted to do. So I'd like to talk about that difference for a minute. So generally, uh, if somebody goes to attend a social skills class, what would they likely be learning? Well, typically social skills are um, facilitate interaction and communication with other people, and those could be verbal or nonverbal, but the kinds of things that they might teach in a social skills intervention are how to initiate a conversation with someone or how to check and make sure that you're taking turns appropriately during conversation, how to make eye contact with somebody uh, and maintain eye contact or how to check and make sure you're not interrupting someone during a conversation or getting, you know, you may have heard of personal space bubble. You don't want to um, encroach on their personal space. So these are some of the kinds of skills that, that often are taught in social skills interventions. Um, those can be important and helpful for many people, but they're not quite the same as what we had in mind that we wanted to do if we wanted to address the kinds of friendship and dating and you know sexuality uh, issues that we had been thinking about. We were instead interested in um, what I would call healthy relationship skills, which are more about um, knowledge and abilities to initiate, maintain, and if necessary, end friendship and intimate partnerships. So for example, um, when you meet someone and you get into a friendship or a dating relationship, how do you know if you're being treated in a way that is abusive or in a way that is fair and respectful and equitable? Developing the skill to be able to tell whether it's a healthy relationship or not, that's something that everybody needs. Uh, and then skills like communicating uh, your boundaries, um, whether those are about sexual consent or something else, th that's an important skill. And also noticing what somebody else's boundaries are and respecting those boundaries. Being able to communicate affection and attraction in a way that feels good to both people. When problems come up in a relationship, resolving conflict, including having difficult conversations when those need to happen. And sometimes some relationships don't work out. So how do you end a relationship gracefully or safely? These are all things that I would call healthy relationship skills. Um, in my uh, career, I had worked in a domestic violence shelter and volunteered on a sexual assault hotline and spent some time working as a counselor in a program for men who had perpetrated uh, partner violence. And so those experiences for me were really making me think about this whole, uh, this area of healthy relationship skills in a way that's different, I think, than, than social skills. So um, uh, Laura uh, took on this challenge of looking into the existing scientific literature to find out, okay, if we're not just talking about social skills interventions, but we're talking about this other idea of healthy relationship interventions, are there any programs out there that have already done that, that have taught healthy relationship skills to, to people on the autism spectrum? And what do we know from randomized controlled trials? So we identified three uh, the UCLA Peer DM program, uh, I don't know that they've published yet the results from that uh, randomized control trial. They may have, but um, certainly we knew that there were, there were uh, randomized control trials and outcomes for these two other programs called STAR and TTT. Um, the thing is, as we looked at those interventions, we realized that they were all designed to take place in person, not over Zoom. And we were interested in figuring out how to deliver something over the, you know, over the internet so that it was more um, convenient or more accessible for people. The other thing is we were interested in working with adults and um, these programs were primarily designed to be delivered to adolescents or um, I think in the case of UCLA peer, it might've been young adults like 18 through 24. And we were thinking about the whole, you know, age spectrum up through, um, you know, mid adulthood or age 44. So we thought, well, there's something uh, new and unique maybe that we, we have to offer in this space. Gonna let Reed jump in here. Yep, so um, leading into that, um, we had an advisory board of autistic people for this project in order to help inform sort of every step of the way. So starting from figuring out what would be in the curriculum itself and then um, 
analyzing the results that came out of running the project. Um, and so to acknowledge all of our advisory board members, um, we have um, M. Chang, Amelia Sanchez, me, <laughs> Peter Warmby, and Mariah Person. Um, and I'm really glad that we were able to get a, for a small group, pretty diverse array of um, like racial representation, race, ethnicity, region of the world, um, gender and sexuality. Um, and one other thing I wanna make sure that's added is that um, we were all paid for our time, which is really important when working with autistic people in the sorts of projects. Um, and we all were offered um, authorship within the project as well, which is also important. Yeah, exactly. So in the beginning we met, we were meeting every three months to talk about like this project and another research project that I have um, going on. And um, over time, the advisory board members, you know, exactly gave input on everything from the content of what should be taught in the Hearts Intervention to like how we should roll it out and deliver it when we, when we did um, uh, data analysis and had results to look at, weighed in on how to interpret our results and how to frame them when we wrote up the paper. So really involved uh, throughout the whole process and, and Laura and I are really grateful for that. Okay, so just to explain a little bit more about where HEARTS came from or how did we develop this intervention, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are grateful to OAR because back in 2019, OAR um, had funded us uh, or a team to do a pilot test of, it was specifically about promoting healthy dating relationships for teenagers who are on the autism spectrum, and that's uh, safer dating on the autism spectrum, and anybody who wants to can download that curriculum the link to how to find that curriculum is right here on that slide, but you could always also just email me. My email is at the end of this presentation and I can make sure that you get that. It's a six session online healthy dating um, class. But when we tried it, we realized, you know, um, I think we need to do something slightly different. We need to not only think about dating, we also need to think about healthy friendships. Sometimes it's the line between friendship and dating is even, you know, hard to call for people. And you certainly need healthy relationship skills for all of it. So we decided to widen that lens a little bit. And then also we thought, well, we don't want to, um, so many things are developed for teenagers. We really want to move to like the adult population. So we went back into a formative process, but, and we interviewed 25 people who are autistic and between the ages of 16 and 24 years old in order to get their opinions about what hearts should include. So this is separate from our advisory board. Um, we did that formative research. We also interviewed seven autism service providers and we got feedback from our advisory board in order to determine what should go into the content of the hearts online class or intervention. Once we had that settled in 2021, we went ahead and we pilot tested the class. And the way that we did that is each class had about, it had between 10 or 20 um, participants. People would sign up online. We worked through, um, we worked with the agency AANE, which people may have heard, heard of, the um, Autism Asperger Network or Asperger Autism Network, AANE. And anyone who wants to can, you know, sign up for classes that they offer, we were one of those classes. And once people signed up for the class, we also invited them if they wanted to participate in the research element. And um, so we have data from 55 people who went through one of the HEARTS classes and we got data from them via a survey before the class started and then after the class ended so we can find out more about their experience. And that's what I'm gonna uh, present to you on now. So in case you are somebody who likes to read the details and this one uh, webinar doesn't quite provide enough depth for you, you are invited to learn more about our formative research process by going to the journal Autism and you could find this research article uh, that describes um, how we put together hearts. But when, you know, after we did that formative research, I think the main things that came out of it or, or some of the things that were really unique was that the autistic um, youth that we talked to and young adults didn't want yet another class taught to them uh, by a non-autistic person to autistic people, telling them how they had to do things or who they should be or what they should do. So we listened to that and we created um, 
a like a team teaching model. So we thought, okay, hearts is going to be delivered by an autistic person plus a non-autistic person who are working together as a team to deliver the information. The other thing that we really became convinced of is that you know presenting on Zoom is is important because of accessibility issues. There were some people who wondered if we should make the hearts intervention like for women only or you know have like separate gender classes versions of it or something like that and we thought about that idea but we ultimately decided that people of all genders should be welcome into the same class and um, we wound up doing that and as, a, as you'll hear i think that actually worked really well we also decided to think pretty broadly about age so there were some people who wondered well how is an 18 year old in your class going to be able to relate to or learn from somebody who's 44 years old, for example? And we thought about that, but we realized that chronological age wasn't feeling so meaningful um, working with autistic people as maybe it would in some other settings, maybe not. And that um, we felt that people, no matter their age, uh, had a lot that they could share with one another and learn from one another. And so that there was actually something valuable about having people from a broad age spectrum all together in the class as well. So that's how we made some of those choices. We also thought a bit about, well, who's qualified to teach this class? I just said that we use teams, right, of one autistic person plus one non-autistic person. But all of these things that are on this slide had to be true for everybody, whether you are autistic or non-autistic. We decided that, okay, a lot of questions are gonna come up about like finding a dating partner or how do you like date and that in today's world, most people use like apps or a lot of people use apps in order to find dating partners or at least they think about it. And so it would be important that the teachers had some experience using dating apps or they probably wouldn't be able to answer questions that helpfully. Um, it was also important to us that all the teachers could talk about things like polyamory or kink or same-sex sexuality, pornography and asexuality in a non-judgmental and totally comfortable way. Um, and that the teachers uh, are committed to anti-racist, anti-ableist and gender and sexual minority supporting practice. It was important that all the teachers had their own firsthand experience making friends and ending friendships and falling in love and ending a serious intimate partnership. And they had to be able to navigate on Zoom well enough to help teach the class and agree that they would attend weekly supervision sessions where we talk about how do you think class went last week and what are we planning for the week ahead that those supervision meetings were gonna be really important. Uh, Reed's going to jump in here as well. Yeah, so um, something different about HEARTS is that we really try to focus on the neurodiversity perspective. So um, neurodiversity is the idea that no two brains are the same and that society should be trying to accommodate and understand people with all different kinds of brains rather than valuing one kind of brain over another. Um, so what that means in this context is understanding and valuing the perspectives of autistic people when it comes to sex and relationships and focusing on what we want and need um, when it comes to skill building in relationships. Um, contrary to a lot of the, the social skills interventions that currently exist, um, they don't necessarily focus that much on healthy relationship skills. They focus on a lot of things like eye contact and knowing like when it's your turn to speak. Um, which may not translate into those, those core skills that autistic people need to recognize what a relationship um, works or doesn't work for them. Because many times these sort of, these social skills trainings can sort of teach autistic people to not evaluate the relationships critically and can be more about compliance. So coming from the focus of um, what does this person want and need out of the relationships and how can we work together to recognize healthy versus unhealthy relationships and make that happen for autistic people, I think is something really unique about what we were doing. Agreed, yes, thank you, Reed. And part of why that was so important, you know, the, um, what Reed was saying, like that we didn't wanna approach this intervention with the idea in mind that, oh, you know, autistic people have social skills, communicate, social communication deficits, you know, why we, we weren't thinking that way, is um, 
I think encapsulated well in this quotation that we had during our formative research phase from one of our research participants who explained that after spending you know, so much of their childhood hearing that the way that they interacted with other people was wrong or that they were doing it the wrong way or that they had deficits or they were deficient, that that really, any social anxiety that that person may have already had, getting those messages from often well-intended, maybe, you know, counselors or people who are there supposedly to help, but, you know, saying, oh, you know, here's how you need to change how you're interacting with people, that that layers a whole extra layer of social anxiety on top of anything that they might already be feeling. And we really didn't want to be in that position of compounding social anxiety for people. And so that's why that neurodiversity perspective was really so important to us. As I said already, uh, it was also important to us that we be sex positive. That's the word that I guess we use to say in non-judgmental and supportive of, uh, you know, wherever people are coming from in terms of who they wanted to date or how they wanted to date or have sex or, or form relationships. So here's the six things that we talk about during the HEARTS uh, class. So um, there are six sessions. In the first session, we talk about what counts as a healthy relationship and how do you tell the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy relationship, or how do you tell if this person that you've gotten into a friendship with or a relationship with is starting to exhibit signs of being you know, controlling or unhealthy towards you, what would you look for? Um, we talk about how to launch new relationships and get those off the ground, so there is some of that. We also talk about, people may have heard of polyvagal theory or you know, it, for people who've experienced trauma, it's important to cover this, but really for everybody, you can learn something about um, how we all tend to react when we get nervous or anxious and why keeping our bodies and our minds in generally like good healthy states is actually, it feeds right into how we behave in relationships and so extra important. Um, we do talk about meeting people and about boundaries uh, and importantly, how to end relationships if you need to get out of one or if you feel like ending one, like how do you do that safely and graciously? So we talk about that. Here's just a few example slides in case this has you curious about, well, what, what is it that you do exactly in the hearts class? You know, each session was a mixture of us presenting some information in PowerPoint slide forms and then asking everybody to give their thoughts and experiences and weigh in on it. We would have discussions. Um, and then we had some little activities that we would do. Each class session was 90 minutes. So this is just an example of one of our slides about healthy relationships and what, what is a healthy relationship. This is, a, you know, we would show this in class to talk about what are warning signs of an unhealthy relationship. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we have that neuro health lesson. So we talk about like what happens when your brain doesn't get what it needs and how that can ultimately influence how you behave um, in your relationships. We covered, you know, somebody really wanted us to break it down uh, in terms of, they, they had this idea, maybe this was common for people during COVID, that you were home a lot and you were thinking about old friendships that used to feel good to you and wondering if it was possible to reawaken, you know, an old friendship or reconnect. And so we had one person in class who wanted to do that, but really just felt so embarrassed. Like, how do you reach out to somebody that you used to have a friendship with, but it's sort of, dissipated? Can you restart it? How would you do that? So we broke it down and we really talked about how you would restart a relationship. Um, by the way, this person tried it and it, this formula worked for them. They were able to restart that friendship. So that's nice. Um, this is a slide that we would use. Uh, we talk about like, well, what if you're having a problem in a relationship? What's the right way to bring that up to somebody else to talk it through with them? And we kind of practice that a little bit. We talk about how do you get a relationship from the acquaintance phase to more of a like real connected, solid friendship or dating phase. So this is almost where social skills classes leave off, right? They might tell you how to um, initiate a conversation or you know start an acquaintanceship, but how do you move out of that acquaintanceship zone into full, you know, real friend zone? 
So that's one of the things that we talk about in HEARTS. Here's the slide that um, you can see where we really try to respect the neurodiversity, or this is one of the ways in which that comes up. So for example, I remember when we were talking sometimes about mm, how, you know, what you might want to do when you're on a date and you're meeting a new person. And let's say some of the advice was, well, you know, you should ask, you have to ask questions to that other person. And, you know, you want to try to draw them out or get them talking about themselves and, act interested in what they're saying and you know but there are people who would say like well i'm not going to act interested if i'm not genuinely interested like i'm not gonna if if they're boring to me i'm not gonna pretend to feel something that i don't feel and so um we would you know how would we respond to that we would absolutely say like you you're right you know that is you shouldn't have to feign interest or pretend to be interested if you're not feeling it it is absolutely your choice and you're right to do that um and also we would you know we might and with various people say like, so you also have a goal of wanting to get into a dating relationship. And so one of the things you can do, you always have the option of experimenting a little bit. Um, you can see if you know you, there's a way that you can express interest, you can still be true to yourself, but you can also soften your stance a little bit in order to see if that gets you closer to your goal of being able to have a second date with them. Um, and tell us what happens. So we would just explore for people what they felt like they would be comfortable with, but but absolutely allow them to stick to whatever feels authentic for them. So I'll tell you about the research study part of things now for a few minutes. Um, so we used a one group pre and post test design. This wasn't a randomized control trial. We didn't have a control group. Um, but we did use valid and reliable uh, survey measures to collect information directly from the participants. And we also got qualitative feedback from them, meaning we got some, um, some of their thoughts and feelings about how they felt like the class went. Again, um, if you're interested in the details, uh, you could always go to, this is a second article that was published in the journal called Autism. Uh, you'll see Reed's name, on here in the list of authors and all of our advisory board members are listed here as authors as well and details are available in that so we asked the participants if they themselves were satisfied with the class and over a quarter of them felt like the class improved their ability to meet new people um, which was a little extra challenging during COVID time we did pick 2021 to pilot test this intervention so maybe meeting new people um, was a little bit hampered by the fact that we were all pretty much stuck in our houses still at that point. Um, but 60% uh, uh, of the folks who were in this um, study reported that they did feel like hearts improved their ability to have healthy relationships. And, and the same percentage reported that it taught them how to improve their existing relationships. So on the whole, people enjoyed the class, which was important to us. Uh, you might be curious, well, who were these people who were in the class? They were between the ages of 20 and 43 years old. They were mostly white, 80% uh, white, um, although there was, you know, some racial diversity. About half the sample was female or identified as female, 55%, 31% identified as male, and 11% as non-binary. Six of the participants had an intellectual disability. And otherwise, you know, they, they were comparable, I think, to other um, populations of autistic people who generally are represented in research studies of this kind. So I'm going to tell you about eight different outcomes that we looked at. There were three things that we really hoped would increase as a result of people participating in this uh, or, you know, during the course of the the intervention and there were five things that we hoped would decrease so here's the three things that we hoped would increase one of them was flourishing having a sense of doing well in life another one was coping coping skills we hoped would increase and a final thing was feeling motivated to interact with other people socially all three of these things did increase and you can so you see that what the score was in the light green color on pretest and the darker green color is what was the score on post test and our p-values are uh, presented to you as well as something called the cohen's d which helps give a sense of how large of a difference you know how how big is the difference between pretest and post test so these are all moderate to the one that's 0.91 is actually a large size difference 
So here are the five things that we sort of hoped would decrease over the course of the program. These things include dating abuse victimization or involvement in a dating abuse relationship, um, emotional dysregulation, um, being uh, very, very sensitive to getting rejected, having that mean that you really like shut down, loneliness, hostile automatic thoughts. That would be when like if somebody bumps into you and you automatically think, oh, I bet they meant to do that. They're probably out to get me. That would be an example of a hostile automatic thought and rather than, oh, they bumped into me. Maybe they just weren't looking where they were going. So we were, we were trying to reduce hostile automatic thoughts. And um, over the course of the heart's intervention, people did appear to experience decreases in hostile automatic thoughts, dating abuse, emotional dysregulation, and rejection sensitivity. Loneliness did not decrease. Um, however, we aren't sure if that might be because, like I said before, we were trying this intervention during COVID and loneliness was tough on everybody. And so maybe we just couldn't really fight against that. Or is it that the measure that we use to assess loneliness, which is called the UCLA loneliness um, measure, uh, maybe that, that one wasn't designed for autistic people and it could be that the way that they answered, um, we, we just weren't able to capture differences. So we don't really know with that one. We did also you know, review the qualitative feedback. And I think one of the big themes there was that people were really grateful to have an autistic co-teacher or autistic facilitator of this intervention, that that was new and different for them. And they really appreciated that opportunity, which was great. Uh, people did think that, we made, that they would have liked it to have gone on longer than six sessions, that we had a lot to cover in six sessions. Some people felt bored every now and again when we went over something that they felt was basic. Um, that's always hard with any kind of class. And then, you know, because we had this on Zoom and we left the chat feature open, some people would be chatting about one topic off to the side while the teachers were trying to present something up on the main screen. screen and sometimes that got distracting for people. So that was one of the critiques that they had. Now I'm going to turn things over to Laura and ask her for any firsthand impressions of what it was like to work with our advisory board or to co-teach the HEARTS intervention um, with somebody who is an autistic co-teacher. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you, Emily. So, um, you know, I think my experience was that I had learned a lot in the past about um, you know, participatory research or research that incorporates um, the people that you're serving with the research. But this was actually one of my first experiences getting feedback from autistic people on um, a project. And um, I think our approach was to discuss all the ideas that we had and just basically incorporate most everything that was suggested. Um, and I'm pointing this out because I think there could be sort of a an approach of, of taking feedback that um, aligns with um, you know, what you already think should happen rather than just kind of um, really hearing all the feedback from a group. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that kind of could undercut, uh, could undercut a project. So um, I think in our case, some of the most challenging feedback um, to, to incorporate was probably about who the intervention was for um, and how to create eligibility criteria that were fair and precise and um, would work for a research study. So um, originally, we had planned to, I think, ex not have people with intellectual disability um, be part of the study, um, but the advisory board suggested taking a different approach of um, explaining the intervention to people and letting them decide um, whether uh, they thought it would be useful for them. So, like, this is going to be pretty fast-paced with a lot of um, discussion, you know, do you think that this is something that you would want to do? Um, and I think uh, instead of sort of having this criteria based on um, that diagnosis or cognitive abilities, we decided to um, to more see whether people, um, you know, could could engage in a conversation with us around some basic questions for them. Um, and uh, I think I think that that this kind of feedback from the board um, really helped me to examine my beliefs about who could benefit from a group like this. Um, and, you know, I think that just like sort of getting rid of labels like high functioning or low functioning and saying those aren't really working for, for autistic people anymore. And, and it's better to just say, 
minimally verbal people or people with intellectual disability. I think it's um, more precisely targeting who we think will benefit um, can end up can can uh, you know provide us with a more inclusive group, a more accessible group, and um, and uh, and I hope that's what we're we're all going for. Um, I also wanted to mention that co-facilitating with an autistic person was really great. Um, we got this idea, like Emily said, from our formative interviews when um, the people that we interviewed were really enthusiastic about um, the idea of getting the perspective both from a neurotypical person and from an autistic person. Um, they thought that there was uh, something, something you know, unique and valuable about having both of those perspectives um, at one time. Um, and I also think it made it clear to participants that what they said was valued in the group, that their experiences were valued to have to have another autistic person talking about their experiences too. Um, and Emily, you might have said this, but we 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 did get some feedback that in the in the future facilitators could do more of the sort of didactic parts of the group. And it sounds like in in one of our iterations of the group, that's what um, that's what you and the facilitator did was sort of um, was uh, sort of um, have the facilitator, have the autistic person basically doing a lot of the didactic parts of the class. Um, so it'll be interesting to see in the future where this goes, you know, if if um, if A and E or other organizations run this, uh, do you just have autistic people who run it? Is it um, still valuable for participants to have a neurotypical person to share some of those kind of, um, you know, perspectives? Um, I, I would be so interested to hear, you know, to see the, see what people said after after being in different classes like that. Um, so yeah, thank you. This it was such a great experience, um, and I'm I'm happy to be here talking about it today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Laura. And we also want to go to Reed. Um, Reed's going to offer up some reflections as well. Yeah, thank you. So I'm um, starting with a little bit about what it was like to be on the advisory board. Um, it was a really great experience. I've had a lot of um, community partnerships as a, for I guess, a researcher and also just a community member. Um, and it makes a lot of difference um, how open the non-autistic partners are to taking our feedback into account and meaningfully incorporate it. And I felt like we did a really good job here in terms of one, us as the advisory board being feeling comfortable um, and open about our feedback and two, feeling as if that feedback was genuinely incorporated. So for example, something that I can think of is pretty early on in the curriculum development, um, someone pointed out that we didn't feel there was enough about like recognizing signs of abuse, um, which is a very important thing because um, people with disabilities can be more likely to end up in abusive relationships. And so this is something we identified as a really important skill for autistic people to know that other sort of social skills interventions might not have even mentioned. Um, and so, yeah, that goes sort of into my thoughts about the class itself is that I think it was made a lot stronger because um, our feedback was incorporated and that it tried to take into account the largest array of experiences by including different, all different gender identities and different ages. Um, I think overall um, that, that made it a lot stronger. And I think that there's definitely opportunities for more targeted classes maybe in the future for people who might feel more comfortable with people their own age or their own gender identity. But I think as a start, like we were saying, that it was really important to include everyone. And so I think obviously that there are things that can be worked on, but I think that that was one of our strengths. Thank you so much. Thanks, Reed, for that. Perfect. So just to wrap up here a little bit, and I'd love to get to questions if anyone listening has questions, we're happy to discuss. But I did want to say that we want to take this research one step further, meaning we want to do a randomized control trial that has a control group. Um, in order to do that, we do have to have uh, a pool of autistic people who are willing to sign up and say, sure, randomize me. You know, meaning I might get assigned to the heart's intervention and I might get uh, assigned at least initially to a comparison condition. We're thinking of an online like book group about relationships. And then we would measure, um, we would have 
you know, data from both groups, the people who got into the book group who like secretly wish that they were also in hearts, they could, after they're done with the book group part, they could go into the hearts class and that would still be okay for research purposes. But we really need um, people who are willing to participate. Here's a good thing though, if people participate, they do get paid $360 to participate. So yes, it's six weeks out of your life and you and maybe it's book group, maybe it's hearts, but the payment is pretty good. So if you know anyone who might be willing to participate, um, we wouldn't be launching that next round of research until 2023. Um, and now is the right time to get on our like wait list and sign up for it. And then you, we would call you when we have the funding and we're ready to go. So would absolutely love it if anyone here would email me or let me know if you maybe you work with people who might be interested in signing up. We'd be so um, thrilled to, to include them. I also thought um, that I would mention here, because we are so grateful to the Organization for Autism Research, that we are engaged in a second project having nothing to do with hearts. This does not have to do with hearts, but it's also a cool project, so I thought I would just tell you. Um, we recognize that the issue of sexual assault for college students uh, is a huge issue in the United States and elsewhere, and that sometimes autistic college students may not feel comfortable using the campus resources designed for sexual assault survivors because the way that those have been set up all the services and and everything is was really not designed with autistic college students in mind and so oar i think um like us believe that there should be something that trains the counselors who work on college campuses with sexual assault survivors to teach them a little something about autism and how they could make their outreach and the services that they provide more accommodating, more accessible um, to autistic students. So we have a, an advisory board of people who have direct firsthand experience as autistic college students and with the issue of sexual assault who are teaching us what it would be important to teach these counselors about. And we are um, working to put together an e-learning training that will be free to any college sexual assault counselor that wants to learn more about autism. So if that if that idea has you leaping out of your seat, you're like, oh, I'd love to know more about that, or I'd love to participate or give you feedback, again, uh, please email me and I would be happy to hear from you and happy to involve you in that project as well. So um, if you wanna reach, reach me for any reason, the best way is email, and you can see my email on here, E-R-O-T-H-M-A-N at bu.edu. I am also on Twitter, and I post things about our research when we have new research findings on Twitter, so that's one way to stay in touch as well. Um, and I'm just gonna leave this slide up while I ask Clara if there are any questions from the audience, because maybe people need extra time to write down my email address or something. So I'll just leave this slide up for now. Um, but that's our presentation, so we can do a Q&A if you want. Great, thank you so much, Emily, Reed, and Laura. That concludes the presentation portion and begins the Q&A session of today's webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your control panel. Because our time is limited, we may not be able to get through all of your questions. If there are any questions that we do not get to today, we will try to get back to you by email. Our first question is, what kind of organizations are you people looking to partner with for the next phase of testing of the HEARTS program? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, uh, I would say if you think your organization could possibly be a fit, email me and let's talk it out. So whether it's a school or an autism service organization or a nonprofit or autistic self-advocacy like group really um i think it's all fair game any one of those types of organizations or maybe some other one that i didn't even think of could be a fit in some way so let's get in touch and talk it out perfect thank you so much for that response emily our next question is what makes a successful collaboration between non-autistic researchers or providers and autistic researchers slash community partners? I'm gonna defer to Reed on that. I think that Reed's 
Reed has been working on that issue in several different with several different researchers or groups, and so probably has some thoughts. I don't want to put you on the spot though, Reed, but ready to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a couple of things to really think about. One is sort of as I said earlier, um, are you giving autistic people equal representation? Um, so that means are autistic people being included in authorship in your research? Um, are autistic people being included? in other decisions about your research? Are autistic people getting paid in a way that's comparable to, to researchers to some extent, or at least like a, a fair amount as, as set out by um, compensation guides that have been released when um, working with community partners? Um, and also um, building in the scaffolding for cognitive access, um, because autistic people, we have all different access needs when it comes to understanding this information that impacts us. And perhaps like for the advisory board that, that we re were on, um, we had to figure out what worked best in terms of email communication, in terms of Zoom, um, making sure that everyone can communicate in the way that works best for them. Um, and so that requires a lot of um, flexibility and willingness to accommodate different needs. Um, and so <laughs> any non-autistic researcher that's that's going into this really needs to be open to that and open to taking a step back and saying, well, I don't actually know about this from personal experience. Um, what do you all think and how can I incorporate this into my work? Perfect. Thank you so much, Reed. Our next question is, what prior experiences do you have that you use to inform your classroom content? Um, well, all three of us might be able to answer that. I guess um, uh, I'll start by saying that, uh, and I think I mentioned this, that working in a domestic violence shelter or on a sexual assault hotline really helped me think about healthy relationships and what healthy relationship skills are at one point in my life. Um, so that was, for me, part of the content. I don't know, let me let me pass that first to Laura and then to Reed to see if you guys have thoughts about that as well. Clara, can you repeat that question one more time? Sure. What prior experiences do you have that you use to inform your classroom content? Yeah, I think um, for me, um, good question. I think that getting to know a lot of different people as a psychologist and just like as a person in the world um, and learning to be really non judgmental about different relationship styles and, um, you know, um, different approaches to sexuality and things like that was um, helpful for me. Um, and just kind of taking a, a sort of like flexible, I don't know, like standpoint for the kinds of different relationships that people could have that would make them happy um, and could be healthy for them. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, just like reading about a lot of different kinds of relationships, getting to know a lot of different people. Um, and I also think like periods in my life when I wanted a relationship but didn't have one and felt lonely, um, for me, that really drives a lot of the work that I do. Um, just wanting to, just wanting, just kind of understanding that feeling and wanting other people to, um, you know, meet the goals that they have for relationships. So, so that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, Reed, yeah. do you want to say anything too? Yeah, just my sort of prior experience and what I brought. Um, so yeah, just first of all, as I sort of mentioned, being an autistic person who has been in relationships is just sort of being the expert of my own experience. Um, also having worked for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, um, I helped run a program called Autism Campus Inclusion, um, which was a, a leadership and advocacy skill building training for autistic college students. And just from talking to students and hearing about their experiences in college, and a big part of that is the sex and dating and relationships. And just this through talking, understanding that sometimes the, the quote is that like there's a rule book that we just didn't get. Um, so those, those norms that aren't really explicitly stated, um, these are things that autistic people want to know about so that we can figure out how to communicate around them. 
Um, and so because it's not obvious to us, it's sort of that hidden curriculum. Um, it's what I'll, so from talking to lots of people, I think it helped me get a better idea of what were these really important concepts that like autistic people who are already having sex and in relationships need to know. And I tried to bring that with me. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you everyone for your responses. Our next question is, do you feel your social skills training does a good job not trying to make autistic people communicate like neurotypical persons? As an autistic person, I've been very resistant to social skills classes because I'm not neurotypical, as I'm not going to com communicate like a neurotypical person. I'm going to communicate the way my brain likes. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I think that that's exactly what we were trying to be mindful of. So we we don't actually think of this as a social skills class, although, you know, it probably falls in that. If there was a giant bucket, I guess you could say that in a way it's a social skills class. <laughs> but we don't call it that. We call it a healthy relationships class for partly the, the very reason that we um, are working on something entirely different. Not The goal is not to teach autistic people to adopt the social interactional styles of anyone else. Um, everyone should be able to be true to themselves. And no matter um, how your social interactional style is, you deserve to have a healthy relationship and you can learn how to have a healthy relationship no matter how you prefer to communicate. So that is very much the idea that we're working with. Um, we know it's a little bit, it's it's new. Um, it's rare, I guess, to find programs that are coming from that uh, perspective, which is that you can have a healthy relationship even if you're you know, sticking to your own communication style that isn't maybe the, the norm or isn't typical. Um, but we think it can be done, and, and that's really the basis for, for the HEARTS intervention. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. I think we have time for one final question. And uh, our question starts with a comment. Thank you for such an interesting overview of the HEARTS intervention. I wonder, how was social motivation measured in this study? Was social motivation considered inclusion criteria for this study, or do you presume that all who participated in HEARTS are demonstrating some degree of social motivation based on their interest in enrolling in this program? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so in other words, this person is sort of asking, oh, well, so, you know, it's great that's, that people were more motivated to engage with other people at the end of the class as compared to the beginning, but didn't your, isn't there already a sort of selection bias built in where you had to be at least a little bit socially motivated just to sign up for a class about socializing? And that's probably true. Um, I think that's a really fair point if that's what that person was saying. That said, we did have a measure of social motivation. That means it's it's like a little questionnaire made up of a bunch of questions. Um, so it wasn't that we just, by virtue of the fact that people signed up for class, we were like, there you go, they're socially motivated. It was more than that. It was them filling out a, a questionnaire um, and, and we can share it, but um, that's one of the, I think that was an original measure that one, Laura, if I'm remembering correctly, although there are there are maybe uh, social motivation instruments that people can can use as well to assess that. Um, but I thought this person made a really good point about the selection bias of being, you know, at least at least somewhat interested in in making new relationships in order to join such a class. Thank you so much, Emily. Well, that is all the time that we have for questions today. Emily, Reed, and Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to share information about your co-teaching experiences with the HEARTS class. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. If you found today's event helpful, we encourage you to register for OAR's next webinar event, Autistic Adults and Other Stakeholders Engaged Together, Asset for Suicide Prevention, which will be presented by Drs. Stephen Shore, Teal 
Bonavides, Brina Maddox, and Sherry Jaeger Hyman on April 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Once you close out this program, you will receive an exit survey. Please complete that to let us know what you think of today's event. Everyone will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's video recording and materials within the week. On behalf of the Organization for Autism Research, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.